In the last three weeks, deadly invaders have besieged the world's beaches. Australian seashores have been deserted in their wake, and the seaboards of Taiwan, Yucatan, Oman, Texas, Costa Rica, New Jersey, England, India, and Thailand are menaced by sea creatures whose tentacles stretch up to 50 meters. Physalia physalis, like the jellyfish it most closely resembles, belongs to the order Nidaria. However, the Portuguese man of war, as Facilia is colloquially known, is no jellyfish. For that matter, it is not even an it, but a they. While it appears to be a single organism, Facilia is, or are, something more like a colony or an ecosystem because it is made up of four different components, each of which could also be free living. So biological terminology is here inadequate because the organism is made up of hundreds or even thousands of other organisms. It contains a massive gas-filled bladder, venomous tentacles, digesting tentacles, even a polyp that harnesses wind and acts something similar to a sail. Like some multicellular organisms, Physalia's genome is distinct and it develops from a single fertilized egg. It also reproduces by spawning gametes that are fertilized by other organisms within its species. But unlike both a multicellular organism and a colony, the single fertilized egg of a Portuguese man of war buds into integrated organisms called zoids, each of which once lived independently as a multicellular organism in its own right before they were all subsumed into the single body of Physalis. So all of this begs the question of what exactly the difference is between organisms and colonies or colonies and ecosystems, and what we mean when we talk about biological individuals. Are you a biological individual, or are you a massive colony of cells? Are you perhaps an ecosystem, given that 90% of the cells in your body are in fact not human, but bacterial? And this is something that uh, many microbiome researchers have demonstrated. Are your human cells, right, each cell in your body, a truly individual, or given that animal cells are symbiogenetic, um, and symbiogenetic is here a $10 word, that means um, they're amalgamations of bacterial cells that a very long time ago got it on uh, and accomplished something in between eating and sex. Um, so given that, perhaps your cells are not individuals, but are more like colonies as well. So, what this suggests is that an organism is, in fact, a concept. It carries rhetorical baggage. It carries discursive expectations, as well as ideological framings. The organism has long served as a metaphor for other types of emergent complexity. So, for example, termite mounds in the 18th century, human societies in the 19th century, uh, the Gaia hypothesis in the 20th century, uh, and in a combination of all three of those, um, smart cities, which I think is the most recent iteration in this century. But um, maybe the organism is a metaphor whose referent no longer works, a kind of ill-fitting rhetorical suit that stretched to fit life forms that are as diverse as bacteria and bees. As a metaphor, it is something about which people Right? life scientists often, but also many others, must be persuaded. And burrowed into those persuasions are ethical assumptions about what kinds of differences make a difference. So tonight I want to ask, what if we were to forget about the organism? And if we did, what about life might we then suddenly remember? But before we forget what an organism is, we must remember what qualities once defined it. Most simply, the organism is the fundamental unit at which the hierarchy of life is organized. So it is a whole living thing that is in its own composed of interdependent parts. 
commonsensically, this means that we can think of organisms as living entities that are first indivisible, unique, whole, singular, organized, and autonomous. But immediately, exceptions begin to play at the edges of these definitions, right? Threads that, when pulled, can threaten to unravel the entire project of contemporary biology, or at least um, subdisciplines that include modern evolutionary biology, the modern synthesis, population genetics, phylogenetics, and functional ecology, which is actually most of modern biology. So um, let's see what happens. Um, so let's start by thinking of Pando. Pando is a clonal colony of quaking aspen. Uh, if you look at Pando, it looks more like uh, a copse of trees, right? not a single organism. But Pando consists of a single root system and a single genome. And at over 80,000 years old, it is among the oldest living organisms or living entities on this planet. However, Pando, an exception to my first criterion, is divisible. Though Pando remains um, or maintains organic continuity, when most of the aspen trees are burned, as they do with regularity, uh, Pando will advance new stems. And any asexually reproducing entity, like bacteria or fungi, will undermine the second principle I listed, which is uniqueness. They're all the same as each other, which is why they're asexual. Um, wholeness, which was my third gauge, is also a very vague sort of thing. So if we think more carefully about what it means for something to be whole, um, we could, uh, for example, think of an example um, from biologist and historian Evelyn Fox Keller, the slime mold. And the cells of a slime mold forage individually, but then merge into a central stock to reproduce. So is the slime mold whole during some parts of its life cycle, but fragmentary in others? Or to take another example, what would it mean to talk about a whole coral reef or a partial coral reef? It doesn't make any sense. To turn to the fourth norm, which is autonomy, um, well, that flies in the face of everything we know about how life works. Um, we're all complexly dependent on one another in ways that are both li large and small. Uh, lichens, most famously, are composites of algae and fungi. But more um, typically, we could think of the fig tree. And the fig could never reproduce without an attentive wasp. And uh, squid could not luminesce, that is, glow, um, if it were not for the vibrio bacteria that colonize its um, sensory organs within hours of its birth. And of course, our own bodies maintain all sorts of physical connections with others in myriad ways. Pregnancy and breastfeeding are two examples of modes of long-term interdependent bodily alliance for survival. And we can you know, hazard guesses as to why those two capacities were underthought by theoretical biologists of the last century. But now that we've gotten rid of those six criteria for what an organism is, the question is what's left. One alternative would be to suggest genotypic identity, right? What kind of genome an organism has and what makes it different from other kinds of organisms. So if we think that identical genomes define a biological individual, this would mean, for example, that Pando is still a single organism but then, of course, so too are identical twins. And conversely, anyone who has received a blood transfusion or an organ donation or, again, been pregnant would, in fact, be multiple organisms coexisting in a single body. So what remains of all of these criteria that have been used historically to define what counts as biological individuality? So I want to hazard one final possible intuitive possibility, which is that a biological individual is spatially and temporally defined. And what that means most simply is that every life, every organism, is the work of a single continuous life cycle. 
And this is something that was first proposed by Thomas Henry Huxley in 1852, and he appended to it the Latin motto, omne vivum ex ovo, right? So everything comes from one egg. But parenthetically, Huxley also differentially defined organisms and zoids. Recall that I mentioned zoids um, with regard to the Portuguese man of war. Um, and he used this definition of what makes a zoid different from an organism to say why the Portuguese man of war is an organism and not a colony. And the quote is, zoids are like individuals and yet are not individuals in the sense that one of the higher animals is also an individual. And I find this definition mystifying at best. I don't understand why it's still in textbooks. I don't know why it's remained authoritative for so long. It makes no sense and it's circular. So that aside, if we maintain this spatial and temporal definition of what counts as an organism, then I'm struck by the fact that the last bastion of biological individuality, right? indeed the only remaining criterion by which we can even still speak of there being such a thing as an organism at all, is that it unspools in a linear and continuous timeline. And so, for the remainder of my time here this evening, what I plan to do is sabotage and subvert that last remaining definition, namely our faith in what biological time is. So I'd like to dismantle it with glee and see what can possibly remain. And the way I'm gonna do that is by storytelling in the grammatical first person. And I know that sounds horrible, but bear with me. Um, the reason why I wanna do that is I wanna think about the literary device that typically cements one particular type of individual. And here I'm thinking of the authoritative and narratological eye. And in doing so, I want to experiment with what are the discursive limits of thinking against the organism, right? What are the descriptive and theoretical ways that we can write at the interface of what counts as I and what counts as we? I moved to the Caribbean recently and the last 2,800 years haven't been half bad. Lately, tourists have arrived to sink their toes into the soft white sands of Bahamian beaches. Although I am, collectively, a beach, I am by no means ordinary sand. Following the words of John McPhee, I'm not the small, smoothed off ruins of mountains. Just as raindrops are created around motes of dust, I form around bits of rock so tiny that in wave-tossed water, I will stir up and move, move and settle, move and settle. Today, I luxuriate along shallow shoals that stretch miles out into the ocean just beneath the Tropic of Cancer, where I'm a neighbor to nurse sharks, spiny lobsters, and conchs. I emerge from the so-called washing machine, a swell of coastal water where the warm and westerly Antilles current crashes into both Atlantic swells and easterly trade winds from the Canary Islands. These battering waves are now my birthplace. You've no doubt seen me, though you certainly never noticed. Humans were once in the habit of carving up and venerating bits of me, imbuing stone effigies with anima and fecundity. So look closely closer at the Venus of Willendorf. Each perfectly tight curl on her head is a single one of me, polished and stained red. And architects have centuries erected out of me, cathedrals both secular and divine, colossal architectonic edifices to rival any petrified shoal. St. Paul's Church, the Pentagon, Oxford's Christ Church, the Empire State Building. The ancients named me Hamite, after the Greek Amos, or sand. Early modernists variously referred to me as Uolithos, Sprudelstein, Rogenstein, Bathstone, Eierstoke, and Cave Pearls. Lately, I'm known simply as an Uid. I am crystal, vegetable, mud, and cell. No one therefore knows quite what to make of me. What does one see when one looks at me, when one does, in fact, see me? I recall imperfectly a passage written by French sociologist, mineral collector, and self-described material mystic, Roger Caillois, in his 1970, The Writing of Stones. This, he said of me, 
every abandoned shelter, every porous structure combines to form through the centuries and the centuries of centuries, a slow rain of sterile seeds. They settle down, one stratum upon another, into a mud composed almost entirely of themselves, a mud that hardens and becomes stone again. They are restored to the immutability they once renounced. Now, even though their shape may still occasionally be recognized in the cement where they are embedded, that shape is no more than a cipher, a sign denoting the transient passage of a species. In suturing geology, history, biology, and surrealism, Kaiwa sought to strike a path between subjectivity and mechanism to identify a phantasmagoric naturalism that would find aesthetics, even mimesis, that predates human thought or art. And to do so, he turned to fossils. Fossilized life, he wrote, was the other writing. It extends capacities like intellect, imagination, and creativity, which are usually associated with humans, much further into the natural world, to animals, vegetables, perhaps even minerals. He identifies a sort of acephalous aesthetic in which sports of nature are not only art, but are also mimetic of life. And so what once was vital is compressed and condensed until it forms something expressive of its lost vitality. A sort of lapidary vitalism, similitude wrought in stone. I make no distinction between life and non-life. These are not distinct categories, but rather time-bound oscillations. Vitalism gives way to latency, and seed turns to stone if you just wait long enough. And I've been waiting some time. As Vesuvius shrouded Pompeii in ashfall in 79 AD, it was Pliny the Elder's last day of life. He spent it putting the finishing touches on his Historia Naturalis, in which he wrote that I am similar in appearance to the spawn of fish, except remarkably hard, and so must properly be classified as a gem. Once, many years later, Swiss physician and alchemist Paracelsus thought he spied me in a mountain ravine in 1528. Peering deeper into the ravine, he found some strange alchemy by which slime transmuted to stone. And so he reported, that from the mucolago of the water are growing and born all rocks and all pebbles and sands are coagulated into rocks. He therefore speculated that life emerges from and returns to stone as spirit operates either on lapidary or on viscous substance. When Robert Hooke peered at me through his microscope in 1667, he named me Kettering Stone after the place from which I had been collected. He wrote of me, it has a grain altogether admirable, nor have I ever seen or heard of any other stone that has the like. It is made up of an innumerable company of small bodies, not all of the same size or shape, but for the most part, not much differing from a globular form, nor exceed they one another in diameter above three or four times. They appear to the eye like the cob or ovary of a herring or some smaller fishes. And so Hooke was naturally at a loss. Was I mineral or animal? He never supposed I might be both and neither. In his Micrographia, he wrote, in this body there is not a vegetative faculty that should so contrive this structure for any, any peculiar use of vegetation or growth. Whereas in other instances of vegetable porous bodies, there is an anima or forma informans that does contrive all the structure and mechanisms of the constituting body to make them subservient and useful to the great work of function they are to perform. And so he asked what reasonable creator would imbue me with form but no mechanism. So allow me to set the record straight. Let's begin at the beginning. The world used to be a different sort of place and I traipsed much more widely, coasting young seas before settling into contemporary climes. Let's surf back, back, back to when natural time encountered historical time, to when both lapsed into epochs geological. Skim with me along temporal swells to arrive at the mid-Archean eon 3.2 billion years ago. 
Our earth had just barely cooled. It was only now catching its breath after being pummeled by asteroids for millions of years. Before continents, before even Pangaea, there was a place named Ur, or maybe it was named Valbara, or maybe it was just a distributed assemblage of microcontinents and no one really remembers. But all life emerged here. Broad continental shelves accumulated limestone deposits as volcanic arcs disgorged lava and ash into alkaline seas. Microbes in hot oceans precipitated gelatinous iron and piped it in bands along the seashore. Calcium-rich waters and shallow tropical seas were my first home. Here I would form a body, a concentric and repetitive glazing and rinsing of calcium carbonate, much like the way a pearl grows. And today I'm diminutive by comparison to what I once was, more than tenfold bigger back then, than the once mineral rich and agitated waters of a fledgling planet. Indeed, for millennia, I had the ocean all to myself. 600 million years ago, I basked freely in milky calcium carbonate rich brine, slowly, ever so exquisitely, slowly siphoning my body from sumptuous mineral waters. A nucleus of quartz or a fragment of lime mud would carry them in a hot tide, lifted up in the ebb and flow of each driven wave, coating itself in a filmy skin of aragonite. And this is where I begin. In shallow waters, I'd sink down to the seafloor, only to be buoyed up again into the light, another dousing of mineral, and descend, rest, and float some more. As I rested, my cortex solidified, thin needles of white aragonite crystals encircling me like a crown. And again and again, a little more crystalline veneer with each cycle, growing myself a body in suspension, then sleeping in sediment. A storm would lash the waters into a frenzy in which I'd be buffeted about, cannoning into sediment and sand, scoured clean as a bone and polished gem lustrous. But I never intended to become the subject of controversy. Either neither life nor stone or yes and both. But if left alone for long enough, I turned to stone. No longer an uid, but an uolite. Or an adjective even to describe both my form and where I'm found, uolitic limestone. Or another adjective to describe when I'm found in the uolitic strata. I am a curiosity and hence have received some attention, even fame, in my time. In 1721, natural historian Franz Bruckmann dedicated a treatise to me, later published in his atlas titled Curious Stones. In his treatise, Bruckmann ponders whether I am, in fact, stone, or, as others have previously postulated, a sport of nature. Or perhaps, he asked, I am the artifact of some ancient creator making shapes of the earth stones. I must be a stone, he surmised, because what exactly makes a stone a stone? I am a stone because I am hard, and if you polish me, I shine. But then he hesitated. I am also an animal because I look like an egg. Bruckmann couldn't ignore my particularly organic and specifically ovoid contours. And so he concluded, that I must therefore be a sea egg that had turned to stone in a great flood, once alive, but now petrified, an oolite, or an egg stone. An oolite is two altogether different sorts of things that are bound by material and form, right? Egg, condensed, vital potential, and stone, accretive, inorganic permanence. Bruckmann narrated my genesis operatically. When, from the intolerable iniquity and evil of man, the divine torches welled up, and the divine Newman opened the deepest springs of the earth and the cataracts of heaven, divine catastrophe followed, beneath which the whole globe was, as it were, divided. Above, terrestrial with muddy, watery things, watery with terrestrial, animal and vegetable with sand, a sludge of earth of various kinds, as I may say, buried together, which as time passed coalesced into one lump, which mass by petrifying liquid or mineral saturated in many places, made heavy and consolidated, 
turned into stone or mineral, a stony metamorphosis of fish and shellfish eggs. My tranquil freehold on the planet's calcium carbonate couldn't last forever. Others arrived who grew reefs and shells and armor and carapaces and even, later still, skeletons and nails and horns and teeth of self-same substance. For the first time, I was freshly at a loss for calcium carbonate and as such dwindled to my current compact dimensions. The waters dried up, for when a storm turned, I was thrust onto sandy shoals and dunes, left alone to turn to stone. Untold billions of me, crowded cheek by jowl to forge adamantine globoid horizons. I mortified and I lithified and I became a ghost of myself, left exposed to Arctic climates as continents drifted northward. My form persisted, but my body was transmuted into other substances. My spherical laminae remained. My substance was replaced by crystalline matrices of calcite, dolomite, and chalcedony encased in limestone. And so it makes perfect sense that overwhelmingly, geologists and biologists believe me to be a stone. An odd one, to be sure, but a stone nonetheless. In 1864, German biologist Ferdinand Kohn found me in the thermal springs of Karlsbad, Czechoslovakia. And following naturalist Johann Friedman Blumenbach suggested terminology, named me Sprudelstein after the mineral waters washing over me. While Cohn may have claimed me for science, Sprudelstein was already well known to those who at the time frequented the European thermal spas of Baden-Baden and Tuscany to soak in and drink calcareous waters. As reported by King Edward VII's physician in 1841, spa goers brought home small tokens of Sprudelstein, either in its natural form or whittled into snuff boxes or polished into other trinkets. Some describe me as a strange little spheroid that mechanically accumulated around a center, something like the layers in a large rolled snowball. And this was the stock story for some time, but things took a turn when some naturalists began to suspect that today Earth is not at all like what it used to be. Earth, and with it life, might be changeable. And so, allow me to continue. For centuries, I had only been known as stone, something ancient, a relic of a long forgotten earth. But then I was found, not in my petrified state, but alive and well, flourishing even in the Caribbean. Henry de la Beche was a contented gentleman geologist and an artist um, best known as a frequent lampooner of evolutionary thinker Charles Lyell. But after his father's death in 1823, he inherited Halls Hall in Clarendon Parish which was a slave plantation in Jamaica. Arriving in Jamaica to spend a year overseeing the family estate, he resolved to undertake a geological survey to pass his time productively. Strolling along Jamaica's eastern beaches that year, he found that my modern form was much smaller, yet still astonishingly similar to my ancient Jurassic self, which he had already seen thick on the ground in his native England. He would later discover in 1851 that under a microscope, I am grooved and canalized by tubes, the agency, he wrote, of minute vegetable organisms. So perhaps I'm not mere stone after all. Delabesh already knew me well because as a British geologist, he had studied me carefully. In the Jurassic, I had hardened into limestone, forging the bedrock of what would become an empire. The Cotswold Hills, Dorset, Somerset, Gloucester, Oxford, the moors of North Yorkshire, the town of Bath. In Lincolnshire, 19th century folklorist Mabel Peacock reported that local women called me the witch stone. Every woman in the parish kept a bit of me in her pocket and hung a stone on her front door to deter witches, boring out a single ooit or two to make a hole in which to thread a bit of twine. I enchanted Victorians novelists and naturalists alike. Thomas Hardy was ravished by fossils. In his 1873 serialized novel, A Pair of Blue Eyes, Henry Knight, which is Hardy's protagonist, for reasons that are not important here, finds himself hanging precipitously from a cliff. And while hanging, he sees there an embedded fossil. And despite his perilous circumstances, Knight is enchanted. Hardy writes, his mind found time to take in by a momentary sweep 
the varied scenes that had had their day between this creature's epic and his own, and time closed up like a fan for him. In a calculated choice, Hardy sets the entirety of his vastly underappreciated 1897 novel, The Well Beloved, on a fictional isle made entirely of oolitic limestone, which was inspired by the actual oolitic Isle of Portland. In his tale, a young man returns home after years studying on the continent. Walking up the steep rocky hill of the isle, he pauses for a few minutes before approaching his father's house. What had seemed usual in the isle when he lived there always looked quaint and odd after his later impressions. More than ever, the spot seemed what it was said once to have been, the ancient Vindulia Island and the home of the Slingers. The towering rock, the houses above houses, one man's doorstep rising behind his neighbor's chimney, the gardens hung up by one edge to the sky, the vegetables growing on apparently almost vertical planes, the unity of the whole island as a solid and single block of limestone four miles long were no longer familiar and commonplace ideas. All now stood dazzlingly unique and white against the tinted sea, and the sun flashed on infinitely stratified walls of oolite, the melancholy ruins of canceled cycles with a distinctiveness that called the eyes to it as strongly as any spectacle he had ever beheld afar. Now, Hardy obviously lifted the indented line to describe the walls of Oolite from Percy Shelley's Prometheus Unbound. And this is a romantic lyricism in which humanity is uh, mortified both by and as stone, in which civilizations incline endlessly toward ruin and decay, much like Shelley's earlier sonnet, Ozymandias. Victorian novelists found in me a concretized allegory for a number of timely themes. I bore the sublime that rocked German romantics as they scaled peaks, while also remaining legible, rational, a rock record, a geological archive, something to be plumbed and made sense of. I spoke to anxieties of progress while also undermining them. The earth and its life evolves, but it is also a scene of untold catastrophe. For Victorians, I was simultaneously an object and a time. The oolitic strata were used to date and demarcate rock beds and fossils. As one scholar writes of Hardy's fictitious oolitic isle, the isle's successive stratification of the different and discrete geological cycles of time produce a whole, the historical island, which nevertheless, as Hardy makes clear, does not involve the teleological, teleological arrow of time that is continuous progress toward perfection. Rather, the isle is the concretionary pro produce of successive yet discrete, final, and non-synchronizable cycles. So by the end of the 19th century, a few geologists continued to maintain that I am merely the product of mechanical forces acting upon minerals in solution. One cited as evidence the fact that he had discovered me in his tea kettle. And yet, Inside my cortex, researchers aided by microscopes began discovering organic beings, algae, bacteria, fungi. In 1890, Edward Weather had discovered my fossilized form to be bedded between Gervinella algae, a blue-green species that happens to secrete carbonate, and my body was cross-cut by worm-like threads. Two years later, a German paleontologist named August Rothplatz traveled to the shores of Utah's Great Salt Lake, where he noticed that on the dunes surrounding the lake shore, I was white, but where the water deepened, I was thickly entangled with globs of blue-green algae, which are also notably producers of lime. And so in the coming decades, data continued to accumulate. In the Alps, in the Red Sea, in the Bahamas, in the hot springs of Japan, I had been intimate with bryozoans, hyalites, and anaerobic bacteria, and I have been so embroiled since the Jurassic. A flurry of research followed, each camp, the organicists and the inorganicists were unwilling to budge, leading petrographer Lucien Caillou to carp in 1935 that no other topic than OUIDs had been the subject of so many studies, offering so few definitive data. So tomorrow I may of course be understood otherwise, but as of today, here is what geologists think of me. I'm a perfect sea egg containing legions. Creatures make a home of me 
burrowing beneath my cortex and tunneling inward to find a welcome respite from oxygenated atmospheres. On my surface, metal bridges coagulate calcium and magnesium minerals into hydrophilic and hydrophobic macromolecular complexes. These interact antagonistically to bind proteins and generate spherical patterns that are most often associated with the membranes of cells. So perhaps I'm a mineral that spontaneously self-organizes into the form, though not the substance, of a cell, a semi-permeable membrane made of stone. But crack me open, and I am slick with living substances, oozing with glycoproteins and algal mucilage, coated by lipids and carbohydrates, lousy with nucleic acids. How might geologists explain that? Well, I don't hurry. Thousands of years tick by as I swell from that first quartz seed to my final form. And during those centuries on centuries on centuries, others colonize me. Seeded with life, I grow into a self-sufficient world in which organisms that make energy differently harmonize their metabolisms to help me grow. The word for this is syntrophy. The hordes within me now receive Latin names. Cyanobacteria named Gliocapsa, Synecococcus, Lingbia, and Nostoc. Alpha proteobacteria such as Azospirillium, Rhodovibrio, and Tristrella. Some bacteria draw sulfate from the environment and release ions that sustain and even speed my growth. And so as they respire, the bacteria form and inform me. When I'm alive, so are they. We are, as one geologist recently wrote, a temporally heterogeneous microcosm an ancient core, and a modern shell. And what can a fossil like me do? What might I say about form and mechanism, or vitalism and inanimacy, or life and non-life? How quickly must I proceed to count as life? And what happens to those entities like me whose lifetimes stretch beyond cultural history and into a time slower, hazier, and ill-defined? Hugh Raffles has this to say about the stories that stones tell. Most of us, most of the time, live in historical time, a time filled with unique events that once done are done for good, never to return. Maybe though, on some days, or in some ways, or for some of us, on all days and in all ways, we might inhabit mythic time the time in which archetypal originary events took place, events which, ever since that originary beginning, are being unceasingly repeated, again and again and again revealed in revelatory things, revelatory things like stones. Fossils are sometimes thought of, Raffles says, as outside of time, as unchangeable or even immortal, but of course rocks mutate and metamorphose and deform themselves. Their very bodies tell of these pasts, fissures and ruptures left by catastrophic heat and pressure, minerals molten, shattered, vitrified, calcified, rent by magma, shaved by glaciers, toppled and lifted up, toppled and lifted up again and again and again. I am a palimpsest if you read me right. A hurricane speeds toward my shoal. I will be whipped up and thinly dusted across the nearest archipelago, miles and miles as far as the wind will take me of scabbed excrescences and laminar tissues. I'll sink into the viscid treacle of the nearest microbial carpet, which will grow above and around me, thicken and harden and die, then grow upward through its own putrefaction until another storm rages when I will salt the living ground again and again and finally turn to stone. And when I petrify, the soft bits within me will collapse beneath gravity, and the small microbial bores in my body will form crystallized casts of radiating needles, a negative image of a fossil in a fossil in a fossil. And I am moved to the poetry of my adopted countryman, Derek Walcott. Why waste lines on Achilles, a shade on the seafloor? Because strong as self-healing coral, a quiet culture is branching from the white ribs of each ancestor. Deeper than it seems on the surface, slowly but sure, it will change us with the fluent sculpture of time. It will grip like the polyp, soldered by the slime. Thank you.